<laughs> so sorry, everybody. Um, all right, well, thank you, Kerry. Um, we have online today, Dr. Annie Preston Thomas. She is the Public Health Medical Officer for Tropical Public Health Services in Cairns. Um, and she's going to provide us with some information um, and the other one will be Rebecca Cross. She's the Education Coordinator for Aged Care Quality Commission. So welcome to both of you. And um, Dr. Annie, I will hand over to you now. Thank you very much, Marianne. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're all meeting on and paying respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm now going to try and share the presentation, so let's hope this works. Can anybody, can people see the presentation? We can. Great. Okay. So today I'm uh, I'm going to talk to you about, give you some information about COVID-19, just an overview and some recent developments, and just have a think about what does it mean for in-home care providers, um, maybe have some discussion about what preparation services have made, and and also I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, um, any challenges that you're facing. So um, let's go. So um, on this picture, you can see the cases that have been reported, uh, the cases of COVID-19, um, which have been reported in Australia. And um, the main thing that I really want to point out is that what happened was back in March and April, we had uh, quite a few cases which were mostly to do with people who were returning from overseas. And um, there were a few transmissions within Australia from those people, but mostly we didn't have a lot of community transmission. And, and most of those, that, that first peak of cases that we saw back in March and April was really to do with um, returning travellers. What's happened now since uh, since June and, and it has been particularly everybody will have been following it in the news, I'm sure, what's been happening in Victoria where we've we've had not just returning travellers but we've had community transmission. And it's not just transmission between people in the community but it's also we can't always, in Victoria, they haven't always been able to... to to work out where the transmission has come from, which makes it much harder to actually control the infection. So it seems that uh, Victoria is now beginning to get on top of it. Um, they've had um, 1,065 cases in healthcare workers, and they've actually got about 10 ongoing outbreaks in aged care facilities at the moment mostly affecting um, residents, but also a lot of staff as well. And internationally, I won't dwell on the international figures, but there have now been more than 20 million cases internationally and over 203,000 deaths. So what is it that's causing this? So, so COVID-19 is the name for the disease um, when people get sick with it, but the actual, the, the thing that's causing the disease we call SARS-CoV-2 or um, Severe Acute Respiratory um, Syndrome Coronavirus number two. So what, what this is, it's a respiratory virus and it's especially passed on, as you can see in the picture, when somebody coughs or sneezes, um, those droplets from your cough or your sneeze are really good for transporting the virus. It's also able to be um, uh, passed on if surfaces are, are contaminated. So, um, so that's why we come to talking a lot about wiping down surfaces and things. And there's also um, thought to be a small amount of transmission possible through feces. Um, one of the challenges that we have is that it can be transmitted before people actually have symptoms. 
So we now know that in the couple of days before somebody develops symptoms, they might already be able to transmit the virus, even though they don't even know that they have it yet. So when somebody gets exposed to the virus, um, it can take anywhere from one to 14 days before they start to get symptoms, start to get sick from it. Usually it's about five or six days, um, but it, it can be longer than that. And the symptoms that people get, they're not specific to COVID-19. They might have flu-like symptoms, a fever, a cough, sore throat, feeling tired. One of the things that has been um, observed is that quite a lot of people experience a loss of smell or a loss of taste. They can also be short of breath, they can have muscle aches, and some people have headaches. But probably about one-fifth of people might have either mild symptoms or, or no symptoms at all. And it's actually only a very small proportion of people who end up having severe um, severe symptoms and becoming extremely unwell from it and ending up in hospital and, and potentially in intensive care. Uh, some of the factors that have been identified as putting people more at risk for more severe disease is people who are older, um, people who are in aged care homes, and that makes that <sighs> Because partly because people are older in those homes, but also because they they live closely together and, and, and it's easy for the disease to be passed on. But you can see there that there's also a list of, of um, various other conditions, high blood pressure, being obese, diabetes, lots of things that can actually make you more at risk for having more severe disease. So how do we prevent it? And on this slide here, I'm really talking about um, at, what can we do as far as the community to, to prevent um, the disease. So one of the things that, that Queensland has done is reduce travel from, from, for people who are coming from areas that have the infection. So the borders have been closed and there's been a lot of work to try and stop people who might be infected coming into our area. Apart from that, the personal hygiene measures are really, really important. So um, there's a lot of talk about just washing your hands with soap and water. If you don't have soap and water, using hand sanitizers to wash your hands and doing that regularly when you've been out, before you eat. Um, so, so hand hygiene is really important. Also not touching your face with your hands um, when, you, when they haven't been washed. And then respiratory hygiene. So making so making sure that people understand about coughing or sneezing into a tissue or into their elbow. And if they do use a tissue, disposing of the tissue promptly and then using washing your hands or using hand sanitizer. And then as we as I said before, because it can uh, be on surfaces, then then cleaning surfaces like door handles and other frequently touched surfaces can help reduce the risk. And that can just be with simple detergents and soapy water because the, the virus um, is actually quite a fragile virus and so it actually doesn't survive all that well. The other thing from a um, personal hygiene perspective is if people are unwell, we ask them to stay home and then they're not likely to spread it. And then the other measure that we've been doing a lot at a, at a national level is all these measures to try and encourage people to be further apart from each other. We know that when, when people are all close together, it's much easier for the virus to be passed on. And so they've come up with this, this um, 1.5 metres. But basically what we know is, is that the, the more that people, the more distance between people, the less chance that, that um, those droplets can, can spread that far. There are there is also lots that we can do as far as with infection control and um, using PPE, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so with Victoria, there's been quite a lot that we've already learned from what, what's been happening um, there. One of the things is that um, there were a lot of delays as far as getting people tested and then being able to follow up to find out who their contacts were and being able to ask those contacts to, to 
to go into quarantine in case they are already infected with the, the virus and also getting people who are infected with the virus to, to go into isolation so that they're not passing it on to other people. We've learned that in Victoria, nine out of 10 people, even though they had symptoms, they had the virus, they had symptoms, but before they went to get their test, they, did, they didn't stay away from other people. And even those people with symptoms, um, they had their test, but then they didn't go and, and isolate themselves while they waited for their result. And so there's lots of potential then for them to continue to pass it on. We know that people are particularly infectious at the beginning of their symptoms. Um, other things that we've learned from Victoria include about healthcare workers and particularly if they if they move from one, they work in one place and on, on the weekends and they work in another place during the week and, and how the, the, it's possible for them to transfer infection from one place to the other. Um, and I think one of the big lessons learned as far as how we can all work to um, reduce the risk to ourselves and to our community is about changing the environment so that it's easy to do the right thing. And that's by things like putting, making hand sanitizer um, freely available so that people um, remember to use it um, and many measures like that. So how do services prepare? And I'm sure that you've all um, given this thought and already done um, a lot of this work. So when thinking about strategies to ensure that both staff and the consumers are safe. Um, so one of the first things is, particularly when we're lucky, fortunate not to actually have an outbreak in our area at the moment, is actually making sure that we've got a, a, an outbreak management plan ready so that we've thought through what's going to happen when when there is more COVID-19 in our region. Um, staff education is so important. So if staff are unwell, it's important that they don't go on and continue to do their work and potentially expose other people. I think the other thing is that when people do have symptoms, it's so important to get tested because that's how we'll know if um, COVID-19 has started to come into the community. And then a lot of work for staff about infection control and what things staff can be doing to, um, to prevent transmission. Um, one option is also adding screening questions for staff and clients so that you actually, before a staff member goes to work with somebody, they each they, they go through a set of questions to check if, if um, the staff member's got any symptoms and making sure that they haven't um, travelled through, through an area where there are cases and doing that screening before people actually go to work. Um, thinking about who are staff who might be at increased risk and what, what can be done to protect them, to make sure that they don't um, become exposed. And then, of course, the, um, avoiding cross-contamination. So, so being really careful if you're um, uh, to not transmit infection from one facility to another facility. And then also the role of um, PPE, so personal protective equipment. And I think I've put a question there, is there is a change in practice required? And I think, I think many of us have found through the course of responding to those first cases, but then also um, now as we think about um, our plans for the future, I think many of us have become aware that there are things that we may need to do differently and just trying to make sure, trying to put those things into place now. And then also making sure that there's good communication. How how will everybody, how will you know if, there, if COVID-19 has arrived in your area and how will you communicate that to staff? Um, there are some resources here that I've just um, put the links to. Um, so, which all of which are just available on the from the government websites. And so, really, I'm just trying to keep this fairly my part of the talk fairly short because I'm interested to hear um, any questions that people have or any challenges. Basically, we've got a rapidly evolving pandemic. Um, we're we're getting learnings 
from both from internationally and, and from in Australia. People have been talking about a vaccine, but but really it's still going to be many months before a vaccine is available. And so there's a lot of stuff that we still need to be doing as far as prevention and suppression um, to try and uh, keep our community safe. And so then I also just put a few questions just as uh, to see if if these are things, how are you going as far as getting information to your consumers? Is there enough information reaching them? Do all the services have outbreak plans in place and, and are there any challenges as far as setting those up? And then also um, uh, PPE, have you... Uh, have you got stocks of PPE? Have you undertaken PPE training with your staff and talked about when PPE is necessary and, and how to use it? Um, so from me, that's that's what I uh, yeah, that's that's what I was hoping to talk to you about, but I'm and then I thought it would be good to open it up to questions. Hi, does anybody got any questions for Dr. Annie? Actually, um, one of the questions there for Dr. An uh, from Dr. Annie is uh, um, information out to your consumers. Um, how um, information out, please. Sorry, sorry, I just want to see the question um, that I don't know. Are you able to see um, the questions online or are you phoning in? Yes, I can see the question. Yeah. Um, are we getting the, the information out to um, the consumers? And is there enough information reaching our consumers? Anybody can come in on that question? Hi, um, Laurie Ann and Annie, um, in regarding to like uh, one of the questions, do we have a, an outbreak plan in place? Um, mm -hmm. I know if anybody in our workplace is sick, then they're to remain home. Um, and we do have a checklist that if we do go out and do call outs with our carers that we, that they, you know, aren't sick and they're not compromised in any way. Um, but as for a major outbreak plan, it's going to be quite a challenge with everyone basically just working from home and limiting contact and otherwise if it is necessary to engage um, having the proper equipment with on hand which is in each of the vehicles when we go out. Mm -hmm. Oh thanks Monica for that. Um, anybody else want to comment on that? And um, and probably just to um, reiterate um, that have you um, undertaken uh, PPE training um, with your staff and they um, they have a, a good understanding on how to, uh, to put the um, masks and gowns on properly? So um, if you go onto our website, uh, you're able to see that there's training there uh, for um, if you're wanting to use it on a staff training day, um, you're quite welcome to use it. Have you got any challenges or barriers um, that you would like to discuss? Hey, Laurie Ann, it's Annie. Um, yeah, Annie. The challenge for training is actually you're using PPE to do training and you need to actually physically have people take the stuff on and off to know if they can do it well. Yeah, and so once you've used it, that's it, it's gone, isn't it? Yes, and supply is still an issue. Okay, so we've got that down. Um, right. Anybody else? 
Monica, can I ask you about, so you said that it's actually difficult as an organisation to have an, a management plan, is that right? Because you're saying that, do you want, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Oh, no, not difficult as an organisation. We, we have a plan that if there is like somebody sick and there is a suspected outbreak or somebody has COVID-19 or has been around someone has COVID-19, then we have a checklist. So, um, and that has to be done with each of the carers if you're actually going to do a face-to-face -face talk um, and also being aware yourself wherever you've been. So um, it is more in the gauge where um, if that does occur is informing the carer that, you know, the visitation can't actually happen face-to-face, -face, that the carer will need to actually go and seek medical advice and the same with any staff. If they find out, then they will need to follow through with those same precautions because the people we're dealing with are quite vulnerable and with the the fear and the stresses that COVID-19 has had on people in the community uh, it therefore lowers their immunity even more so I guess we're just trying to take all precautions. Dr Annie, um, Monica's um, the organisation that she uh, works for um, is a little bit different to um, the other in-home care um, providers Okay. Is there any other questions for Dr. Annie? No, it's Narelle from B in Mackay here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we've got a management plan in place that's administered by our head office down the Sunshine Coast. Mm -hmm. And um, because we're still community based, uh, we've gauged all our movement on what. Um, yeah, the health department updates are where at this point we've got really good PPE supplies. Uh, all our staff have had COVID training. Um, we we take that off the Department of Health websites as well. So we've been um, keeping up to date. We, uh, we're we slowly coming back into social activities in community. Mm -hmm. And again, we maintain whatever um, the restrictions are, we're sticking with all of those as well. So we're managing quite well, to be honest. Great. Thanks, Narelle. And um, Larry Ann, um, we just have a comment as well from Tina Quayle. She said, sorry, yep. she doesn't have a microphone. Um, mm -hmm. They've provided all their clients with a pack at the outset of COVID-19, which included fact sheets on infection control, symptoms, um, contact hotline, etc. cetera. Um, they've been trying not to alarm their clients by contacting them directly again with further information, but they're constantly in communication with staff and updating them through email, which they then pass on to clients. Okay. Thank you. Um, if there's no other questions, um, oh, we will send out information. Uh, to, yes, um, someone's just come in. Can you see that response there in the chat? Yeah, Kerry? it's just a request for a link to um, the PPE training. So um, we'll send that out later mm -hmm. on today. And um, so if you have any questions, um, your the... Um, contact to go to is your local uh, primary um, health unit and we can uh, tropical yeah is it the tropical public health dr Annie so yeah so for Cairns yep. and Torres State the public health unit is tropical public health services yes mm -hmm. and for um, Townsville Mackay and Northwest it's the Townsville public health unit yeah okay so Thank you, Dr. Annie. So what we will do is provide you with those phone numbers. And um, so if you have any questions, um, uh, they're the best ones to go to um, that um, you'll need to uh, just get the answers and that for. Um, so if there's nothing else, Dr. Annie, thank you so much um, for dialing in today. There are a couple more. There are a couple more comments that have come up on the side. Yep, Kerry, have you got that? I do. Um, Greg from Focus Healthcare said um, there's substantial training resources available for staff. A concern with the 
residential difficulties in Victoria is that there's an area that's failed staff uh, that staff may need to be aware of. It seems that one of the things that's happened in Victoria um, is also just that that um, although a lot of the cases are in the aged care facilities, it seems that a number of the cases, it's not so much that the staff, when they're at their workplace, are actually, you know, in their work environment, they're actually doing what they need to do. They're, uh, although, you know, given that there may have been some places where there weren't sufficient PPE supplies. I can't speak to that, but it seems like the the transmission to staff has often occurred when they've been relaxed and out of their work environment. Then they've, you know, and so I think you know there are challenges there because um, you you get relaxed in your home environment and socialising, and then potentially that's when you catch it, and then possibly you attend work without any symptoms because they haven't developed yet, but you can already be infectious. So that's one of the challenges. But yeah, so you're, so Greg's saying that there is actually a lot of training available for staff. Yeah. And it, I think it's just that, that difficulty about trying to um, remember that it's in our home life as well as in our work life, we need to be a little bit careful. That's correct. Um, is there anything else that's come through, Kerry? Uh, no, that's all at the no, moment. But I've um, I've just added the link to the um, Department of Health website with the PPE mm -hmm. training. So yeah. um, if anyone wants to access that, we'll send it out again later. But um, you can just go into the chat part of this um, this recording and access it from there as well. Yeah. And Thank Tina you. Has added a comment. Uh, she said that she she's at their organisation as home care providers, the care workers provide information to the clients. So that's great. So that means your staff are actually having those conversations with the clients. It's good. That's good. Okay, Dr. Annie, thank you so much once again. Um, and um, uh, hopefully um, that uh, we will speak to you again and that you wouldn't mind coming on again if there is anything else that we need to share or any updates. But thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. Um, and so our next speaker um, is Rebecca Cross. So, Rebecca, are you on there? I am. Thanks, laurie -Ann. Okay, so Rebecca's, um, uh, she's the Education Coordinator from the um, Aged Care Quality Commission. I've asked um, Rebecca to um, sit in today um, just to give you an update um, from um, the Commission with us. So thank you for that. And you're able to put your PowerPoint up there? Hopefully, I'll just quickly share that. Mm -hmm. okay. Oops, sorry, just bear with me for a minute. That's okay. Is that showing on the screen? Yes, it is. It is. Okay, great. All right. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Laurie-Ann. Um, I'd just like to start off also by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders, both past, present and emerging. Um, we'd like to thank the forum for having me today. Um, as Laurie-Ann said, I'm one of the education coordinators based in the Brisbane office at the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. And um, I'm not going to take up too much of your time today, but I just thought I'd just give you a bit of an update on um, kind of what's been happening um, within the Commission that relates to the home care space um, and just focusing mainly on COVID because I think that's kind of the theme of what your forum is about today. Um, so the, and some of these things you might already be aware of. So the first thing I was just going to talk about is the consumer engagement project that the Commission has been undertaking in the last couple of months. Um, and it was a project designed to um, engage with consumers and tailored given the COVID-19 circumstances. So what we've been doing is conducting um, telephone contacts, telephone interviews with consumers 
and all their representatives um, to hear about their experiences of the care and services that they receive from their um, home care providers. So the Consumer Engagement Project has only um, been in relation to home care packages, so it hasn't applied to um, CHSP clients or consumers that you might have. Um, so we're looking at making around 5,500 phone calls. We're nearing the end of that, so that will be wrapping up in the next couple of weeks. Um, there's a series of questions that we're asking them over the phone, so there's 18 questions in total. Um, a couple of those questions relate to um, COVID-19, so around continuity of services, um, uh, staff's infection control uh, practices, you know, use of PPE and things like that. Um, the other questions that we cover in the survey um, relate to the aged care quality standards. So we might be asking, we ask questions around, are they treated with respect? Does staff follow up when there's issues that they've raised? Um, does the frequency of their services get updated as their needs change? Um, and questions around how services could be uh, improved. So if there were consumers or their representatives that didn't want to do the telephone interview, which only took about 10 minutes, I think, on average, then um, there was the option that they could complete a paper-based um, survey as well. So the questions um, and the whole process of phoning consumers was designed with input from Dementia Australia. So they helped design that approach. Um, and also some initial findings we got from La Trobe University, which is where it actually highlighted that the telephone interviews were consumers' um, preferred mode of um, contact as well. So once we've completed um, all of those phone calls, um, we will then collect that information. So that information will actually be used to inform um, our risk-based approach. So it's kind of will be intelligence for what we need to do, other services out there that we need to be visiting, um, have we identified any kind of sector-wide risks that need to be a focus of our um, performance assessment activities. So once we've evaluated uh, and analysed all of that data, and the outcomes, um, those survey findings will be published on our, um, on our website. Um, another thing that we've been doing is in relation to our performance assessments. So um, over the last few weeks, we've um, commenced assessment contacts via phone with home care providers. Um, and the focus of those has been around COVID response plans and preparedness if um, there was a need to immediately activate those plans. Um, so the focus has obviously been for providers in Victoria and also in, um, I think, hotspots in New South Wales as well. Um, so that's not to say that if there's a need for that to then be performed in other states, then that could also also happen. So it's really just about seeking um, assurances from providers that their COVID response plans have been developed and that they could um, immediately activate those if need be. And just also looking to see that there are arrangements in place to manage risk to consumers and staffing supply in the event of um, an outbreak within, um, within your services or within the areas that you provide services. Um, we've also commenced um, or recommenced, I should say, um, undertaking um, site visits as well. So all of our site visits are conducted in line with COVID Safe Australia guidance. Um, in terms of our staff, there's some strategies we have in place as well, like ensuring that all of our staff have um, received their flu vaccinations. We do um, pre-screening risk assessments. So that's risk assessments around our staff, our own staff's health as well as risk assessments um, of services prior to entering on site as well. So just getting um, information about whether there are any um, positive cases of COVID, um, people that may be tested, those that um, may be symptomatic. Um, there's also been specialised briefings for our staff around um, use of PPE, um, infection control practices, and then we're also ensuring that we're following strict infection control practices when we are coming out on site. So where we are actually undertaking those um, visits, the performance assessments, they are based on, on risk. So there's a reason we want to go out there and have a look at what's happening um, for that home care service. Um, so I guess always when we're looking at our, our risk-based approach, so we've got a regulatory strategy that actually outlines what our risk-based approach is. So it's proportionate, risk-based approach, um, 
it's about understanding and responding to both systemic risk and then looking at where there might be individual provider risk. So COVID is a good example of where we're looking at systemic risk, where it's um, sector-wide, community-wide risk as well. So when we're focusing those activities um, for our site visits, visits that we are doing, we're really focusing on areas where there's the greatest potential for harm to the health, safety and well-being of um, consumers, with the consumer outcomes always being, um, I suppose, our number one priority and the focus of what we're doing. So we're responding to the context, the conduct, um, the culture of an organisation um, in deciding what action we need to take. So all of that influences our planning, how we conduct the audit, how we report on those activities as well. Um, so the assessment contacts that we've been conducting via phone, we just call those monitoring assessments. So we're not coming to a view about whether you, um, when we're making those phone calls, whether the service um, complies with the aged care quality standards or not. It's really a discussion we're having with them around um, preparedness for um, COVID-19. Um, the other thing that has recently been introduced um, that's not specific to um, COVID-19, so from the 1st of July, the Commission now has a register of non-compliance and regulatory actions. Um, so on our website, we now publish all non-compliance by providers with their responsibilities. That's both for residential care or residential services and home care services as well and includes the regulatory actions that have been taken by the Commission in response to um, the areas of non-compliance. Um, so that information remains on our website for a four-week period, and then that's moved to an archive page. Um, and I believe that's updated every fortnight where there has been non-compliance and then the regulatory action were taken. So an example might be that um, a home care provider or even a residential service um, doesn't meet particular um, standards of the aged care quality standards. So it will state which of those eight standards they don't meet. And then it will say the regulatory action. So the reg regulatory action might be that um, you had to revise your plan for continuous improvement, or it could be um, that there's a notice of non-compliance or um, a notice to agree to the actions that the commission has identified. Um, or it could be um, a notice, oh, it could be that sanctions have been imposed. Um, so that information is now available for anyone within the public to have a look at that um, in relation to performance of a service. Um, just to let you know some of the resources um, that are out there, and I know when um, Dr Annie was speaking and I think um, might have been Narelle was talking about accessing Department of Health resources. Um, these are just some resources that are available on our website. Department of Health has some really great um, just short modules for your staff. If you haven't accessed those, I'd encourage you to have a look at that as well around the COVID-19. Um, we've got some resources which are around um, are you alert and ready? So this was an advice or some guidance that was which was put together by our chief clinical advisor, Dr. Melanie Rove. So she's pre prepared um, the Are You Alert and Ready? And there's one there that's specific for home care ser home services. Um, and whilst it's been uh, particularly targeted at home services that are being delivered in Victoria around preparing and responding to a COVID-19 outbreak, um, it would still apply to all other states um, if you're looking at how prepared are we. So um, the advice or the guidance has been informed by the national involvement by the Commission in monitoring and supporting providers to identify and mitigate pandemic related risks. Um, so things like continuity of um, services being delivered to your consumers in ways that would reduce any risk to of COVID-19 infection and transmission to your staff and your consumers. Um, and ensuring that there's appropriate infection control practices that are used by home care staff. So um, in the guidance, it breaks it down into eight kind of key topics, um, which are around um, pandemic and business continuity planning. So it does look at the planning, it looks at staff health, it looks at staffing and staffing availability if there was to be um, an outbreak, the whole infection prevention and infection control, um, ongoing or continuity of service provision, um, PPE, 
So having availability of that and ensuring that staff um, are familiar with the use of that. Um, communication and also consumer wellbeing. Um, and I guess in particular, the consumer wellbeing is looking at um, with people having to be isolated, spending more time in their um, homes, is just the impact that isolation can have on consumers, which can lead to a deterioration, not only in the fact that they might be feeling lonely, but, you know, can impact on their physical condition, whether that be their mobility, their um, uh, function uh, to be independent, um, the social connectedness, the psychological and, you know, emotional well-being, and I guess it can also have an impact on their um, nutritional status. So um, I think that's a really useful resource to have a look at. And I have included the links at the end of this PowerPoint presentation to these resources as well. Um, I'm not sure if people have heard of um, ALICE, which stands for the Aged Care Learning Information System. So ALICE is an online learning platform that was um, developed by the Commission. Um, it was launched back in February um, of this year. So it kind of was launched just before um, we were really seeing things kind of increase around um, COVID-19. So it may be that a number of people haven't heard about um, the ALICE um, education programs, but it's really designed so that um, staff working in aged care can access our educational programs at sort of anywhere and at any time. Um, so the initial modules that are on there focus on the eight um, aged care quality standards and also key concepts that might fall out of those standards as well. So um, some examples might be, it talks about um, dignity of risk, independence, um, uh, infection, um, I don't know how it's infection, uh, organisational governance will be picked up there. Um, there might be ones around privacy, a whole range of different um, kind of key concepts that uh, open disclosure is an example of another one. Um, that all relate to the eight standards. And then over time, we um, add to those as well. So there is actually a link on the um, ALICE platform to the Department of Health um, learning modules around uh, COVID and infection control and prevention as well. Um, so it can really just be used to help you support ongoing professional development for your own staff. So I think one of the great things about it is um, one, each aged care service provider is entitled to four complementary registrations. So if you haven't accessed those yet, I'd encourage you to do that. So um, that's those free ones or complementary ones will be available until the end of March 2021. And then there's also the option to purchase additional um, registrations as well. Oh, sorry. Yeah, registrations as well. So I think they're roughly 30 something dollars per um registration and um, a staff member can move in and out so you don't have to start at standard one and work your way through it might be that um, a staff member says i'm really interested in learning more about um uh you know a standard six so they can start there or they might go i'm really interested in some of the key concepts so um, i'd like to learn more about what does dignity of risk mean or what does open disclosure mean? Yet, how can I support consumers to be independent so they can kind of go in and out? Um, and then you can have someone who's an administrator within your organisation who can then look at people's um, staff members' progress on how they're going with that. And there's certificates available for completion of each of the, each of the modules. Um, so some really good resources there. Um, and there's a real mix in the way that the information is presented as well. Um, lots of little short videos and storyboards that pick up on um, examples both from residential care and home care um, as well. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. And for consumers. Um, so uh, there are, and I know one of the questions that Dr. Annie was asking was around, um, you know, what information is available to consumers? What have you been giving to your consumers? There are some resources on our website, um, which you can use to help consumers to understand what they can expect if there is a COVID outbreak. So some recent ones that have been um, put onto our website are around how to stay st stay safe from COVID-19, staying connected with people that you love during COVID-19, 
and how do I stay active and enjoy myself during COVID-19 as well. Um, so there's some short videos, there's posters, there's how-to guides um, that are there with those resources as well. The other resources that we do have are storyboards. So the storyboards have been on our website for a few months now, but we've added to those as well around um, COVID-19. Um, and there's user guides that go with the storyboards as well. So the storyboards provide a really good kind of pictorial of um, the different topics as well. Um, the main focus or the reason that they were designed was more for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander services and consumers. Um, and they're really just about illustrating key behaviours and priority issues. But they can also be particularly um, helpful for supporting people whose English or liter literacy levels might be a barrier when it comes to accessing information about COVID-19. Um, so the, what, what the storyboards do is explain that information more in pictures and just sort of some keywords as well. Um, so yeah, relevant for providers, consumers, their family members and representatives across the aged care sector. So there's ones that are specific to COVID-19. There's one around keeping yourself safe, which is for consumers, um, keeping your loved ones safe, sa staying safe in remote and rural communities, and then working safely in community care um, as well. Um, and I guess just in relation to the Department of Health uh, resources that people have mentioned already, there's also the um, CDNA guidelines that you may, CDNA guidelines that you may already be aware of. So they're the um, communi communicable disease um, national guidelines that are available and really useful information in there to help you inform some of your um, outbreak management and kind of pandemic planning as well. And the last slide um, just includes just some links. All of these links are onto um, our website, but there's um, the COVID resources. So um, that's a really good place to check on our homepage because it includes regular updates as well. Um, so they are being updated um, quite frequently. Um, the ALICE, so the online learning um, platform. So if you'd like to access and you haven't already done so, your for complimentary registrations. If you um, use this link, then that will take you to how you can register for those. And then of course, the consumer resources that I just spoke about. So I'll just turn that off. So that's it for me, unless anyone's got some questions. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, are there any questions for Rebecca? No, no, no questions. It doesn't look like there's any questions, but Tina has said, hi, Rebecca, thank you. That was very informative. Thank you, Tina. That's great. Oh, yes, Tina has a question. She's still writing. <laughs> For some reason, I can't see the um, the little meeting chat, laurie I'm not sure why, but... Yeah, it only comes up every so often with oh. Matt um, too, so. You can try just putting your cursor onto your screen and there should be a little pop-up menu that comes up down at the bottom. And there's yeah. like a writing bubble, but it's, it's not working for you, obviously? No, oh, no. Okay, that's strange. It normally does, but for some reason it's not there. Um, Monica's just put a comment up to, um, thank you for the valuable resources. I was going to ask you about them. Oh, great. Um, I'm not sure what the, I can't, I'm not sure um, what's the best way, just so that people have those links, laurie whether you can send out the PowerPoint presentation or um, post it in, I can't get into the chat, otherwise I could have posted some links in there, but um, you can access all that information on our website. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Kerry, is there any way that we can put that onto? Yeah, the I can. Chat? Um, I'll. I think I've got a copy of your um, presentation, so I'll put that into the chat. Um, and um, Tina's just finished writing. Um, she wants to know if the um, 
Alice training on standard eight would be suitable for their committee for organisational governance? Uh, um, absolutely, I think it would be, yes. Yep, and she's yep. also said that the storyboards are great um, and exactly what they need for some of their clients, so they'll definitely be printing them out. And, um, oh yeah, and Monica's just asked if we can post the information so she can share it with the rest of her team. So um, I'll do that after the meeting so yeah. if anyone wants to access that if you just come back into the um into the meeting link you can have a go uh, go onto your chat through teams and um those links will be there and we'll email them out as well actually um i was going to see um gavin are you there i am lorian uh, <laughs> gavin's in the room next door so i, I oh. <laughs> Yeah, but there's <laughs> Gavin. Is there any way that we can um, put those links onto our website too? To the presentations. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We can do that. And those links to the um, training um, or the resources that Rebecca was speaking about. Yeah, absolutely. So any any of the resources that have been flagged as being really useful for clients or providers we're happy to put them on there yeah just send uh -huh. them my way so yeah. if it may maybe we collate them through yourself or Kerry and then um send them to me and I'll organize to get them live as soon as possible yeah. I'll just introduce Gavin <laughs> should have done before Gavin um Broomhead is our communications person with the COVID-19 response team and um yeah, so Gav's um, been doing all our, our communication. So, and he's just um, in a moment, we'll uh, give you an update on our website. Rebecca, um, is there any more questions for Rebecca? No, but I just thought of one other thing when you were talking about communication there, Laurie Ann. Yeah. And I think that PHN, um, in collaboration with someone else, you put, have, there's some resources that I think have been put together around communication. I think I was reading something that's specific around COVID-19. Is that right? It might be a different... Um, it might be um, Brisbane North or something. It was might that? be Brisbane North. Yeah. But um, just talking about communication there, one of the things I heard Janet Anderson, who is our um, commissioner, she was saying the other day that um, just one of the things that they've kind of we've kind of seen or learnt just with um, those services that have been dealing with... Um, outbreaks of COVID-19. So this would go back to, you know, like even New March and the other services in New South Wales and now Victoria, is that where there's been good communication with family, um, the staff have been well prepared, there's contingency plans in place, there's a good stock of um, personal protective equipment, the staff are trained in how to use that in the event of an outbreak. Um, they've looked at staffing models in the event yeah. that there is an outbreak and the impact that that can have on your staff as well, that they've been in a better position to um, to deal with cases when there have been cases of COVID-19. And mm. service providers that have been more complacent in that planning is where they've struggled when um, there have been cases of um, COVID-19 and that really that strong leadership has been key. So there's probably no surprises there, but that's what they've really learned is... Yeah. Where you're complacent and think, oh, we'll worry about that when we need to. It's really about all of that planning and hope that you won't need to use it, but then you've got mm. those plans that you can implement those, activate those straight away. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Rebecca, I know it was short notice, but thank you so much. That's um, okay. I really appreciated um, you dialing in today and providing us with that information. Yeah, um, pleasure. Hopefully we may be able to, you know, I'll stretch the friendship a little bit more when we have um, a residential aged care facility um, a meeting too. So that would be really good. But thank you so much. That's okay. Happy for you to contact us anytime. <laughs> and um, I've got your phone number now. now. Yep. I got your phone number now, Rebecca. Yeah. So that's what, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, enjoy the rest of your forum, everyone, and um, thank you for letting me participate. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Gavin.